Welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast, brought to you by Milo Tree. Here's your host, Jillian Leslie. Hey, welcome to the show. Today, my guest is Courtney Whitmore from the blog Pizzazzery. Courtney is not just a blogger, she's also a cookbook author. So welcome to the show, Courtney. Hi, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so excited. So, okay, Courtney, you and I started around the same time. In fact, when we started Catch My Party, which is a site for people to add their party photos to our site, you were one of the first people to add your parties. So I have to say thank you. Yeah. Yes, I remember. And I feel like it's been such a long journey and it'll be eight years for Pizazzery next month. And so it's just so exciting to see kind of how we've grown and especially how the entertaining blogger um, kind of industry has grown. It's been really fun. Yes. And then we met in person um, about maybe three years ago at a conference. Yes. Remember yes, that? Indeed. And, and it was so like, fun. I love when you've known somebody online for so many years and then you and I knew what you looked like because I've seen your pictures everywhere and then all of a sudden I got to actually like talk to you and it was so fun and exciting this feeling just kind of in this blogging community it's so crazy because you're like hey girl hey I know you I just talked to you on gmail a minute ago so exactly there's really no difference it's um especially when this is kind of what we do full time. These are kind of like your coworkers. In some sense, I say that other bloggers are my coworkers because they get it and they do what we do, but we work mostly by ourselves. And so y'all are coworkers essentially. Exactly. And there is this feeling of like, we get it, we understand it. And it's not, I would say not competitive as much as it is like, I don't know, like there have been times where I've reached out to you, you've reached out to me to ask questions or we, you know, shared, we did an Instagram share together. You use Milo Tree on your site. So there's just this, I don't know, this feeling I always find in my life, when I explain what I do, people don't quite understand it. But then when I talk to somebody like you, we get it. Yes. It's like a whole underworld of blogging confusion. And sometimes I'll have to, you know, email you and say, Hey, what does this do? Or what do I do here? Because there aren't exactly textbooks, you know, and so it's kind of learn as you go. So I'm so thankful that there are other people that do this so that I can ask questions and we can share information. So it's exciting. Yes. So now tell me, how did you start? Because again, we started a while ago. So what inspired you? What is like the story behind Pizzazzery? Yes. So back in 20, gosh, 2009, uh, 2009, I mean, um, I was working at the Vanderbilt Career Center and I was just not creatively fulfilled. Um, I did not love it. I did not know what I really wanted to do, but I knew that was not it. I did not want to sit in a desk and work for someone else for nine hours a day and then leave and go home and watch Lifetime movies and think, <laughs> is this it? Like, is this what my life is going to be like for the next, you know, 50 years of working? And, um, I didn't know a lot of people in Nashville at the time. Um, a lot of my roommates from college had moved away. I was single at the time. So I started taking a painting class and the girls at my painting class, I fell in love with them. They were just so sweet and so fun. And so I decided to throw my first dinner party. So I was now in a town home that had like a real dining room. So I invited those girls over and we just had a dinner party and I had more fun setting up the dinner party. Uh, granted, I loved sitting at the dinner party, but for me creatively, I had more fun setting it up and styling it. And, um, I thought, huh, you know, maybe I could do this, but I didn't know if I wanted to be a party planner. So I'm thinking, well, then what else is there? So when I was researching ideas to set the table is when I popped up on a few blogs, um, hostess with the mostest was one of them. Um, thoughtfully simple was another, there are a few blogs out there, not very many, And I thought, this is so fun that they take their pictures of their parties and they put them on there. And I thought, let me see, let me just see if I could do this. And again, this was such a little hobby. This was not meant to ever be full time, Hmm. but, um, I created the website again. It was not great looking uh, eight years ago. It was basic looking, you know, got the job done. Um, and I started uploading those photos and they weren't even great. Like, I think I probably took them with my Blackberry, like, you know, but I just, I loved the community that was already kind of growing with food and entertaining bloggers. And I just hopped in and Twitter was a big deal. Then there was no Instagram. There was no Pinterest. It was Twitter and Facebook. And eventually I had some people want to advertise. And that was when you would sell banner ads by the month. And then I thought, so you well, would great. put the, right. Somebody would come to you and say, yeah. we want to put an ad up on your site. Yes. And I would say, 
you know, pull my big girl panties up and just sat on a, on a dollar amount. I'd be like, that'll be dollars a month. Like I knew what I was doing, you know? And then, so I thought, well, gosh, if I sell 10 of those, you know, that's the rent or whatever, you know, and I started adding it all up and I thought maybe I could leave this job. And of course my parents who were, were, were just had helped me get through college and graduate school really had no idea what a blog was and just did not want to hear it when I was describing it. They're like, Courtney, that's cute, but what are you doing? <laughs> and so, um, I started doing some local TV and I had to kind of call in sick at the, at the real job to get to go do that. And then finally, it was just too much. Um, but I, I would eat, sleep, and breathe this when I would leave my full-time job because I wanted it to work. And so finally, about four or five months later, that first July, I quit. And it was a leap of faith. But mm. um, I just kept working on it. And through social media, a publisher contacted me. And then it led to book deals. And I just never stopped. I refused. I, I guess the fear of going back to a job that I did not love was paired with something that was obviously a creatively fulfilling job. That, that combo, the fear of going backwards and then the fact that I did love what I was doing, that combo just was dynamite. And it kept me from ever just sitting around. Um, and so I have never looked back. And thankfully, I always wonder like, gosh, what if no brands want to work with me next year? Like, how am I going to make it? And thankfully, you just cross your fingers and there's never been a time like that. And the industry's grown so much, so I've been very lucky that I have been able to ride this this fun wave, and I hope it does not stop. So, <laughs> it's so been great. I have a couple questions. The yeah. first one is, have you always been creative? Yes, but not necessarily around tablescapes. So um, I've always been So wait, into- will you explain what a tablescape is? Yes. So just the gorgeous setting down the table. So the place settings, the forks, the knives, the the centerpieces, the flowers, that whole bit and party food. So when you would set a gorgeous Christmas tablescape, you know, down your dining room table. So um, I've always been creative, but not around that. So when I was in college or high school, I was not setting up tables. I didn't even have a table. I was, um, you know, maybe it was, it was painting or it was making necklaces or it was ceramics. It, it summer camp. So I've always been crafty, Mm -hmm. but it was not until I had a dining room table and the ability to do tablescapes. But I grew up watching my mom, um, essentially like Pinterest in a notebook. So she would cut out stuff out of magazines and create like a big old three ring binder. And she actually had a lot of her tablescapes photographed and she wanted to have a book called Franzi's Tables. So I watched her set up tables, but I, I really was not into it. Like I didn't even walk over and look at it that closely, but for some reason, I suppose it must've been seeping into me <laughs> yeah or in your genetics yes yes so, so, so this is it, my absolutely. so this is my next question you work with your mom yes I and do. so what is so, that about yeah when um she lived in raleigh north carolina where i grew up but when i was pregnant she decided to move here and be closer to family and obviously it was a natural fit she was flying in to help me with shoots and book shoots but it just made sense for her to be closer so she comes over um not not every day but days we shoot so I swear she's a better stylist than I am I'm better at the business side and the blogging side but she's just very good at pulling together a table and then I kind of step in and tweak it and 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 make changes and kind of know what's on trend and all that but she's just really good at you know if I want to do a DIY napkin ring she'll go I'll make one as like a prototype and she'll go make another seven because she just loves that so yeah wow. it's a good it's a good team thing. and how is it working with your mom has it brought you guys closer it's good um sometimes she'll design something that I think is is horrific and bless her and I have to kind of like let her down gently but the, the good thing is that I, I can still be myself like if I say I don't feel good you know like I'm, right. you go on go do your thing today as opposed to someone else where you always have to kind of tiptoe and say well, I like that shade, but let's try another one. Like, I don't have to do that with her. I can just be a little bit more frank, which is nice and time saving. So, wow. And now, but your books, okay, so you're a cookbook author, and your books are these beautiful desserts and treats. And can you tell us about how that started and how you got into that? Yes. So, about two months after I went full time with Mazazzari, so this is probably six months after I started the website. I was on Twitter and I did a giveaway for a wedding book that just talks about how to throw really pretty Southern weddings. And when I was facilitating the giveaway, so when I was trying to figure out how to get the, the, the winner, her book, the publisher, um, the editorial assistant who was emailing me asked me if I would ever consider writing a book to which I'm like, there, uh, yeah, yeah. I would love to, but there's no way. I mean, there's no way. And she said, well, I'm going to put you in touch with one of my editors. And then in the back of my head, I'm thinking like, this is nuts, you know? 
But the editor called me and said, um, we talked about a few things. I wanted a party book and they said, no, no, no. You know, we have this, these things called push up pops and I knew what they were. They were kind of a dessert trend at the time. Can you explain and what she they said, are? Would, yeah, they're a little bit like those Flintstones ice cream pops with a little container and you push up the bottom. Yes. But people were putting other things besides popsicles in them. So they were putting like cake in them or um, drinks in them. I mean, cut pie, like anything you could put in a little container, like, right. um, like a parfait type of deal. And so she said, would you write like a niche book on these? And I'm thinking, not exactly what I wanted, but look what this might be able to do for me. So like, yes, of course I will do that. And um, so then I started on that book and they had another one called Candy Making for Kids and they did not have an author. It had been signed with a photographer. And so it was kind of a crazy, like I stepped in halfway, but I said yes to it wow. and did those to back. And then I pitched Frostings and said, I'd love to do a book on Frostings. There was not one at the time. Did Frostings. Then I kind of took a break, had a baby. And then I, I'd still been asking for this party book for years. That, no, no, they tell me no, you know. And then they had a new editor come um, from Simon & Schuster to the publisher that I work with. And she called me and said that she had pitched one at editorial team meeting. And they had said they'd love to do a party book now. And um, they mentioned my name and she called me and I probably passed out. And, <laughs> and so that's my like signature book. It's the name of my site. It's what I always wanted. Um, and it came out last fall. But that's kind of how the books happened. It just... They're kind of love projects. It's totally different than blogging. Blogging, you know, you create and you could have it up within 30 minutes. So the book, you create and you see it again a year and a half later. Um, but they're both fun. They're both great. Wow. And are there similar, like, because the books are just, I mean, everything you do is beautiful. The books, oh. though, are so beautiful. And I've seen them, like, at the bookstore. And I'm like, I know her. I know who she is. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, I don't photograph the books, but I'm thankful for really great photographers. Um so it's it's wonderful. It's been great. And I did a book tour with a couple of them. And it's so fun. And I think brands really like to see that I have products out there. I think that it helps differentiate me. The blogging community is quite saturated. So you just kind of have to find ways to stand out. It's not, it's not impossible to start a blog now. But I think the books help me stand out. Um, and they just show that this is something I'm in for the long haul. That this is creating content, whether it's for a book whether it's for a blog, whether it's for a magazine, I don't care where it really goes. I just love to create it. So That's amazing. Now, yep. here's a question. Are books money makers or is it really to create this reputation, something that you can then, you know, say to brands, "Look what I've done." Like how do you see it? It would be it would be the latter. They are not a money maker. And I could I could sit here and try to tell you, "Oh, yeah, they're, it's a great, it's great," you know, and but but to be honest with you, and I would rather be honest with all bloggers they're not money makers unless you're at the top of the New York Times bestseller list for, for months. And so you, they're just not. And um, it's you do it for the love of the project and you do it for what it might potentially help you do down the road. And I think I'm able to charge more for brands because of the books. Um, right. I think that it helps. It differentiates me. It sets me apart. Um, but they're not money makers. You do make money. Um, you don't go under or negative, but you just don't make a ton. Um Okay. There's just all of those things that go into it by the time that, you know, the physical book is made and mine are all hardback so that there's just the prices. You you just don't end up with all that much by the time the publisher's paid and everybody's paid and, and what something's discounted sometimes. It just it's all kind of by the time it, the dust all settles, you're not walking away with that much. But um, to me, I find it such a passion project that it's mm. all worth it. That's so nice. OK, so let's talk about monetization then. How at how do you monetize yes, as a blogger? So there are a few ways I make money, which I is a good tip to have. So you don't want all your eggs in one basket. So the number one, when I look at my, my finances at the end of the year and I can see where it all came in, I am making most of my money off brand partnerships. So mm. um, that is where I'm making the bulk of what pays the bills. The second way I make money is is ad revenue. So when people visit my site, that ad revenue. Um, my page views are not what they used to be. And I don't know many bloggers that, that are having higher page views. It right. all kind of just settle out. And I have a theory on that. But anyway. Um, what's your theory? But, so ad revenue. Wait, what's your theory? My theory. My, my, well, I, I, especially for what I do. So Instagram and Pinterest are so huge now. I'll just explain it using Instagram because it's easier. So if I want to see a gorgeous table and I'm scrolling Instagram and I see Courtney post a pretty table and I see a picture of it. 
that gives my wheels turning to design something. I don't need to go to her blog and see six right. other angles of it. Um, so I'm basically handing it over on social media. Now, food bloggers still have great page views and my recipes still do well. Why? Because they see the cookie and they need, they need to go to the blog to get the recipe or they need to go to the blog to get the DIY. But if pure just tablescape, you can get enough of what you want without clicking through. So there's no, there's no real incentive. Um, but that's okay because my brand partnerships pay me more for a tablescape. So it all settles out in the end. Um, but ad revenue is, is definitely more of a consistent thing or right. brand partnerships may not be. You don't know who's going to come down the pipeline. Um, now are you reaching brand out partnerships to, the most. Oh, sorry. Are you reaching out to Go brands ahead. or are they reaching out to you? They're reaching out to me. I don't have a problem reaching out to brands, but my feelings um, monetarily would be that I might make more if they come to me. If yeah. I go to them, I'm going to have a hard time swallowing the rate at which I'm going to throw at them. So um, I've been lucky that I've had brands come to me and I've been able to pick and choose brands that I think are a good fit for my audience. Um, but they come to me and then um, ad revenue. And then the third would be affiliate and royalties. So those are kind of at the end of the list of the three ways I make money. So, got yep. it. Can you walk through what it's like when a brand reaches out to you and how that process works? Sure. So it's usually an email, um, and they kind of tell me that they want to partner. It's usually from an ad agency or a PR firm. Um, not an ad agency, mostly mostly a PR firm. Um, sometimes it's directly with the brand, but I would say eighty percent of the time it's with a PR firm. One that I've likely worked with before, but it's a different contact. Um, and they email and say, we'd love to, to set up something for Easter using our product, our, our potato chips or whatever the brand is. And then I usually go back and say, are y'all thinking recipe development or are you thinking more party setup? Because that's kind of the two fields I play. And so then they say, what are the rates for both? You know, and they kind of want to know the options. And I go back and I quote them a rate. I don't have a media kit because every project's different. Okay. Um, I don't like media kits. Anyway, I just think, I think it's a waste of time because I, I'll have one brand that wants a table that ends up being so simple. And I'll have another wants a table that, that they want three DIYs all over the table that, that took me two weeks longer. So if I put a rate on a tablescape, I'm hurting myself. So, okay. um, then we go back and forth and they agree. And usually they're wanting, usually they're wanting a blog post and then a, they wanted me to send that blog post to all social media channels. So it would be a post on, you know, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, and Twitter, um, Google plus maybe, although I, I swear, I think the Google plus might be headed downhill, but I, I still sometimes hop on there. But anyway, so then, um, I'll create the content more so now than I've ever seen. They want to review it, which Ooh, okay. is sometimes a headache, but you just kind of, you factor it in. Um, then once they reviewed it, you just hope there's no reshoot. And if there is, I have a reshoot fee. It's if I followed all the guidelines given to me. And then I um, write up the draft. They can review the verbiage, make sure that I've followed the FTC guidelines of disclosing that it's a sponsored post and all those details and that I've, that I've represented their product in the way they want that also feels right for me. Okay. Then the post goes up. Um, sometimes they want analytics later. <laughs> sometimes they don't. Um, okay. So it depends on the partnership. But usually I'm just creating a recipe and then I'm photographing it or I'm creating a table setup and then I'm photographing it. Um, that's kind of a start to finish and, and how long, I pepper those thoughts. how long would you say a project takes? If it's a single post and not a year long ambassador program. So if it's like a single post, which a lot are, um, I'd say about a month, usually they'll come to me a few weeks before an event, like the Oscars, if they want me to do something for that. And then I'll have to kind of create it in about two to three weeks. Then they might want to review it that final week, make any changes, and then it'll go up live. So about a month. Um, they can come to me sooner or, or with less time, but it just depends on if I can pull it off or not. Got it. Now, in terms of then social media, kind of where are you? What what, what works with Pizzazzery? Yeah, social media is so huge, and it always has been. Um I, I say that social media follower numbers really help me with brands because I'm even getting some brands reaching out wanting only posts on social. So that's just how important social is. And especially because like I said, people might only view the content on Instagram. So it doesn't quite behoove a company to come to me and only want a blog post. So some may say, we don't even want it on the blog. We want three Instagrams, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so Instagram is my number one 
spot that I'm sitting on daily as a user and also interacting. Um, Facebook's there, I, their algorithm stresses me out, but yeah. Instagram is where I'm getting DM people asking where those napkins are from or wherever. Um, and sometimes as far as back to ad revenue, I do create some content for some companies, Instagram pages that never sees mine or my blog, but like Bath and Body Works, I'll create some almost as like a hired stylist photographer. Um, so sometimes bloggers can get a little bit of an ad revenue stream that way. So like creating content for brands, but it's never coming through the sponsored channel of your own blog. You're just helping them create something. Do you get to, um, like, do you get tagged in those or are you really just behind the scenes? Depends. Um, if I am making, it, sometimes we've negotiated that. So I'll take a lower rate if I can get tagged, but typically the follow throughs are not what I would want them to see that. So typically I just charge enough that I don't care if, right. it, they don't, they don't tag me. Essentially it looks like Bath and Body Works shot the photo, which I don't, I don't care at the end of the day. I'm hired as a photographer for that. And I don't care where it goes once I have a rate that I like. Right. And, and it was like an, then I have a problem. But I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, my contract is not for print with them. So, can you uh, can you talk about? We don't have to get into specifics, but how you think about your rate because bloggers tend to kind of not know. And, and my advice is always think about what you, how many hours you think something will take you. Um, figure out what you would want to make per hour. Come up with that number and then double it. Oh, for sure. I was so about tell to say, me, like, whatever. How, how do you think about when you're coming up with a rate? Yeah. Um, first of all, recall very quickly that you have to take the taxes off of that. So it's, it, I, I talked to my accountant and there's not an exact number from year to year, but I, t I tend to take 30% off of that. And then in my head, that's what I might be able to take home. And that's a huge difference from, so you might say, a company came to me for something for $5,000 and I go, Oh my gosh, $5,000. And, and that is being waved in my face. And I want to say yes to that, but, but step back and realize it's not going to be 5,000 that you take away. So, so set your standards there and then recall all the things that you're going to have to go buy. So like, especially a tablescape, I own a lot of things, but food and flowers are expensive. And so I will have to go and get all those things, drive to all those places, come back, create it, style it, um, hope it's not raining on the day I want, hope the flowers don't die and have to rebuy them. These are things that have happened to me. So mm -hmm. all of those things happen and then I'm photographing, I'm editing, and also just the time and energy, and you don't wanna to take too many sponsored posts, so be careful, don't look. I would rather work less and make more, and so now <laughs> I'm at a place where like if I take a tablescape um, for, from a company, I want to, basically like I think I'm making now what I could, I, I did, a few years ago, it would take me five tablescapes for clients to make what I now charge for one. Well, that sounds more fun to me. So, um, and, and brands are understanding the value of it. And a lot of this content lives on forever. So there, you might feel scary when you hit that send button with that rate, but send yes. it. And you shocked when they come back and say yes. And then you're like, oh my actual heavens. Like they said yes to this. And, and so unless it's a scary number, don't send it. I mean, double it. Like you're worth it and your value and um, I can't, you kind of can figure out a little bit that you're worth it. If you go throw an affiliate link onto something and then you see all the people that buy it you're like, Oh my gosh, they listened to what I had to say, you know? And then you realize that brands should be paying for that because you're able to, to get things sold. And, um, that's ultimately the real, the, the point. So they're not, they, they want beautiful content, but the point is that they hope that, that, that when they see something styled on a table, that your followers are going to go, go buy it and do it. And, so I love to be able to see that on the affiliate side that I actually can get that action by a reader to happen, you know. And I would say for me, becoming, I, I say this, becoming a mother has made me a better negotiator. And the reason is I just don't have a lot of time. So when somebody will come to me to catch my party and say, hey, we want to work with you. I will do my, I take my advice, which is I'll think, okay, what should I be paid for this? But I know that I am not counting in all the hours of driving to the store and buying the flowers that die and all of that. And so I know to double it, but then I get this like feeling in my, in the, the pit of my stomach where I think, oh my God, I can't sit, I can't send this. Oh my God. But then I think I'm too busy. I'm too crazy busy. So what I do is I press send and then I think I'm going to be so busy in five more minutes that I won't ever be able to think about it again. And if they get back to me and say, yes, great. And if they don't, I'll probably forget about it. 
So instead, right. I don't have the time to be freaking out in my head about the fact that, oh my oh. God, I can't believe I asked for that. And I will tell you more often than not, the brand comes back and says yes. That's true. So before I had my daughter, who's three now, before I had her, what I would do to myself is think, and again, I worked from home, no kids. Okay, so I had time to kill. So if a brand came to me, I felt like I tried to give a rate that they would say yes to because I had time, right? Like, I don't have anything going on in the next week. I can do it. So I might as well make at least a thousand dollars. I'll just quote them a thousand because I have time to give. Now, I would like to make more, but I want to make sure they take it, right? I want to make sure they say yes to the rate and I have the time. So that's the game I played. Then when I had Blakely, I didn't have the time to give. So if they wanted me to do it, I was going to have to, to, to like get someone to watch her while I went and did it. So I charged so much so that if they said yes, I wasn't resentful. Oh. Well, what's happened is I make a whole lot more now that I have a daughter that I play, that I play, I don't play dirty, but I play, um, I play like, I guess if here's my rate, here's the, the, what I can pull off. And I should have been charging that rate back when I had all the free time. But instead I was like, well, I don't have anything else to do. I'll do it for that rate. Right. But now there's other stuff to do. So I play, I'm going to give you this rate and we're not going to go back and forth a lot. Like, here's what I can do. And they do, they take it. They and I'm like, it. why did you that back then? And so then you're like, oh, oh goodness. Now I have to try to figure out how to get this done with a child. But you know what? Because I charged what I did, I'm no longer resentful. I'm not at the craft store at eight o'clock on a Thursday night being resentful. I'm like, oh man, they said yes, but look what I'm going to get because now I, I, I'm not resentful is the worst thing that can happen when you're like, gosh, darn it. Like I didn't, I, I said this and then now the daughter's sick, but I, I agreed to this for lower than I should have. And nobody's happy then. Right. Exactly. So, and, now, and now you can send her to college. Right. Right. <laughs> and I do think that you might say, I feel like if I were a blogger and I was hearing this right now, I would think, yeah, but what happens if they don't and then you don't make any money that month? Okay, yes. so that's why I, I do really, even though social media is really important and even though some brands are wanting only you for only posts on social, social is not going to give you that monthly ad revenue. And though I don't make a lot on ad revenue, it is consistent. Now, yeah, it's higher in the holiday months because the traffic's higher in the holiday months. Right. But that is why I, I think it's important to work on your blog and your page views, at least in some capacity, because then you can play the game where you can take a brand project if you want it or say no if it's not a fit. Or if they say no to your rate, you can say no problem. But you can't do that a lot if you have no money coming in in any other way, right? So you want to get those page views up to get that ad revenue so you can get some of your basic mortgage, you know, the electrical yes. bill. If that's covered and those things are safe, which it's, it's not totally that way for me, but, but kind of, um, then I can play the game with brands where I'm only going to take the ones I love and you're going to pay the rate I want, or I don't need to do it. Right. So that's when you're in a good sweet spot and it takes a little bit to get there. Um, but know the value of your time. It's so huge, you know, so Absolutely. don't do it just because you have the free time. And I definitely recommend you do blog, that you do own your blog, that you do focus on your blog, because at the end of the day, as we've seen with social media, you're just a sharecropper on social media. So you want to own something. Yeah, you don't own your account on Instagram. Like you don't, they can shut it down. I mean, they can end Instagram and move to something else. And then all those followers you spent so long building up, you, what do you have now? You know, yeah. so um, grow your email list. That's huge. Grow your, grow your blog. Those are important things that you can control. Um, and they'll, they'll, they can actually give you a passive income, which is so huge. So but huge. if you have free time, don't take a lower, don't quote lower because you have nothing going on. That free time would be better spent taking a few online courses, listening to podcasts. Like I would do some online photography, food courses, creating your own content um, that you can then drive traffic to your site rather than creating sponsored stuff for cheaper than you should be paid. Absolutely. You know? Now, Courtney, how many hours a week do you work given that you have a four-year-old? How many hours are in a week? Because that would probably be it. No, um, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say more than I want. Um, I don't start and end because I have a toddler. It, it, it starts and ends all the time. So I don't work like an eight hour day. I work all over the place, but it's constant. I don't even know that I could put a number on it. My brain, if I'm not physically at the computer or on my phone, my brain's still thinking about it. Um, unless I'm literally in front of my daughter. And so some might say that's just not real healthy. And what I say to that is at least I found something that I love that, I, right. that I can't get out of my head. 
Um, so all the time, probably nine hour days if you actually had to put a number to it. So, and the one thing that I would say about, um, working with your daughter, because I've seen posts of yours where your daughter will mimic what you do and she wants to put together tables. And I think that I have a daughter too. I think that that is such a great thing for our daughters to see. Yes. Yes. Um, She's not exactly sure what I do, but she knows I set tables and we had a little table made for her and little chairs. And sometimes I'll have like extra fabric scraps or like old plates I know I won't use. And I have a big old bin in my prop room of stuff like that, like plastic cutlery. And I let her set the table and she'll, she doesn't want to quote play house. Like she wants to quote play party. And I kind of hope it. she doesn't go to a house sometime and say like, you know, we went to a birthday party recently and she asked where the hats were. And I'm like, blankly hush it, you know, I'm like, <laughs> but but I think I've, I've loved having her be able to incorporate um, kind of what I do into her daily routine because she's just kind of, she's got to kind of come along with me because this is what I do. And, um, you know, I think it's fun. And when she was little, she got like a little toy, like a leapfrog laptop and she would sit there and pretend to work with me. And that's just the reality. And I do stop and, you know, focus on Blakely a lot. And she's at a little, a little preschool. So that's when I kind of go hardcore work, you know, and when she gets home, I'm, I sort of play in the prop, prop room and um, have fun with her. But I think it's important to let them see that we work and it's not just a behind the closed doors, you know, just at a computer thing. So exactly. it's fun. Exactly. So now what about your business are you most excited about? Oh gosh, how it's morphing. And I think so many bloggers are like, I won't do video or I won't ever write a book or I don't. And to me, a lot of those things do scare me. Writing a book scared me. Doing video scared me. But if you want to stay in this industry, then you, it's a, like a big wave pool. Like get your, you know, floaties on and ride the wave. And so I video, that. I don't totally love being in front of the camera, but I just shot two full days of video because that's what the brand wanted. And okay, I'm on it, you know, and I wasn't totally comfortable shooting still photography eight years ago either, but I figured it out. You know, you figure it out and you get comfortable with it because that's, that's where you have to go. Um, I'm most excited about maybe another book. Um, I don't know. I, I it's on the table. It's, it, it would be a love passion project again, because we already talked about how books and, and once you have four, it's like what five really is a, is a passion project for me. So <laughs> that, um, maybe a product line. I'm in some talks. We'll see. Um, I don't, those kind of things. So different stuff. I will always love creating content for the blog. That's the bread and butter. Um, but I think these offshoot things that don't necessarily make you a ton, that's what keeps it interesting. So eight years later, you got to find something that's going to keep it interesting. And, and I think that definitely, that definitely helps. So those are the things I'm most excited about. Oh, that's and I'm wonderful. actually in yeah. a, kind of a new social media platform pops up. I'm like ready for another one. You know, I, I get kind of bored with those. I mean, I'll, I'll keep on pin, pinning and keep on doing Instagram, but I kind of hope somebody else pops up with a new one. Oh, that's funny. Now, what are you growing with Milo tree right now on your blog? I actually think I have it set to two different things. I rotate. I like to rotate and see which one does better, but I think maybe right now I'm uh, it's on Pinterest. I'd have Got to it. check. I like to change it. And sometimes I have it on my email newsletter. I also like that. Got it. Um, but I like, I like the ability to rotate around. Great. Now, if you had one piece of advice for a blogger starting out, let's say who want, who's in our space and wants to do something creative, maybe with parties, crafting, recipes, something like that, what would it be? If the, what I tell people, I call it the Monday morning test. Um, I just would apply to any any genre, but you could certainly apply it to like an entertaining blogger or food blogger. So if you're listening to this and you kind of want to start a blog, maybe your Instagram's taken off and you're thinking, do I launch this to a blog? Um, then I call it the Monday morning test because if, if you get up, if what you're doing does not get you up and out of that bed at like 6 a.m. on a Monday, then you shouldn't be doing it. So when I left my job at the career center and I thought, oh my gosh, I love to sleep and I'm so not a morning person. How on that first Monday am I going to get up and do this? Well, I was up, I was up at like five o'clock ready to go. And that's how I knew I was in the right field. So especially works if you're a night owl um, or if you're a morning person, what keeps you up at midnight thinking about it? That's how you know that you're in the right space. So though you might love setting pretty party tables, if you can't get up and on that computer and read eBooks about blogging and listen to podcasts about blogging and learn about photography, then you shouldn't be doing it. So all those things have to happen and you got to be up and go in. So do that Monday morning test and that'll tell you whether or not you can kind of do this crazy job we're in. Um, it's so rewarding and, but you got to be able to 
you got to be able to kind of get up that Monday morning at 6 a.m. And not every Monday morning. That's just a metaphor. But you know what I mean? You got to be able to really want it because you'll work harder than you did at that day job. But the work is better. I can stop for a moment if someone calls me. I can go and have lunch with a friend, but I'll make up the hours later. But that, that you have to have enough self-drive. So if you're not driven, don't hop in. Um, create the parties for your friends and make recipes, but don't make it a business. Only make it a business if you like the business side of things. So learning about plugins, learning about finances and taxes, um, it, it's all worth it if you really love what you're doing, but just don't forget about that side of the business. I love that. Okay, what is the one tool that you could not live without? Any tool? Oh. Any kind of tool that you use. Besides the camera, um, I love the Milo Tree plugin. I love anything that helps me grow my social media following. Um, oh, thanks for that. Um, oh my gosh, probably my camera and and I and I, I edit in Camera Raw. I know I should use Lightroom. I don't understand it. There's there's me as a blogger needing to go do an e course, and just because I've been doing this for eight years does not mean I know everything. So there's an example of of something I need to learn on my own. But I would say that camera lets me take that content and edit it and make it beautiful. And without that, I'm stuck. So I would say that, um, Photoshop and, and camera raw are where I edit besides that, some great plugins on your site. Like we talked about, definitely be on WordPress. That's the platform you should be on. Those are the tools of the trade. Um, oh, wait, there's not any other of, magic thing. What kind of camera do you have? I have a Canon Mark, um, D five, three, like okay. the, I'm trying to have like four names, but, but Mark D three. Um, I think that's what it's called. <laughs> I've had it a long time, but my favorite lenses, if you're listening and you shoot, um, food photography or table photography, I really love the 50 1.4, the okay. 100 macro, the hundred macro for food. And then the one I pick up most often for tables or life, although it's heavy, it's the 24 70. Um, you can get in, it's a, the only zoom lens I use. Oh, so, um, that, that's really the, my favorite lenses that I use. Awesome. Well, Courtney, how can people reach out to you? How can they find you? Yes. Um, Pizzazzery.com. It's kind of spelled funny. Um, Jillian spell will probably. It? Yeah. P I Z Z A Z Z E R I E. And it's kind of a combination of the word pizzazz and patisserie, pizzazzerie, if you're curious. Um, so the best way is to reach out to me, Courtney at pizzazzerie.com or DM me on Instagram. That's probably where I would see it first. Um, so email or Instagram. Um, I'm on all the social channels, just at pizzazzerie on all of them. So Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, all the things. So find me there. I'd love to chat with you. If you had a question I didn't get to here, then just come ask away. But hopefully I can, hopefully I've inspired you if you're, if you're interested in blogging or want to know more, you know, it's a fun job and it's so rewarding. And I think it's just so great, especially for kind of women entrepreneurs or men, you know, either way, I convinced my brother, he's a um, food blogger in upstate New York. So I convinced him to be a food blogger after he finished his PhD. So I can pretty much convince anybody to be a blogger if you come find me. <laughs> I love that. Well, Courtney, thank you so much for being on the show. Yes, thank you. This was such a pleasure. If you're trying to grow your social media followers on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Pinterest, plus trying to grow your email list, definitely check out Milo Tree. It is the smart pop-up you add to your blog or your site, and it asks your visitors to follow you on social media or subscribe to your list. Just a couple things. It's super easy to add to your site. We offer a WordPress plugin or a simple line of code. It's Google friendly on mobile so you don't have to worry about showing pop-ups on mobile. It's lightning fast. It won't slow your site down and you can grow multiple platforms at once. So check it out, milotree.com. We also offer your first 30 days free.